best man <laughs> working. <laughs> what a stress. So I got it. Flip and out. Yeah, you got are it, you man. On, what, are you on your phone or are you on your computer? No, no, no. I'm on my phone. Okay, cool. But we're gonna have to ask you to do it on your on your um computer though, because but we can talk you through it, like actually. So check it out. Check my lights and everything. Ah, <laughs> oh, well done, bud. <laughs> but but what if if you can maybe just put it up a little bit, like so it's a it's a yeah yeah. There we go. There we go. That's perfect, bud. But I'm okay. assuming. How are you doing that? No, I'm just I'm lifting it up with my hands. <laughs> You're gonna have sore shoulders about right at the end of the chat. <laughs> it's, gonna be like a, it's gonna be like a like a workout. Well, I guess you're used to it, bud. Flipping, throwing stuff around. Yeah, come on, yes. yes. Let's see what you got. This is just a phone. It's not a bottle, bud. <laughs> you should check my biceps as well from all of that. Now, people don't realize. <laughs> and I did it like I was talking. And then after I came on, the MC came on and he goes, yeah, good on you, mate. Thanks, Gareth. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, no way. Oh, that- you've never <laughs> told me the story. I picked yes. up a little bit of a twang in some of my words and stuff. So it's ever since that flipping one line that he said, I was like, right. This is yeah. Like that. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, you, have just- you had a few Negronis, my man? <laughs> no, not yet, actually. Sure. <laughs> I, I possibly should have. I possibly should have. <laughs> <laughs> Waking at dawn. Alrighty ho. Good morning there. Travis Kuhn from Cape Town, South Africa. How are you doing today, my boys. man? Morning, boys. Lekker. How are you doing? <laughs> lekker, man. Nice <laughs> to, uh, How's it going? Thick lekker yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I even said to myself, you know, if I don't open up with a solid lekker, then uh, I'm not doing South Africa proud. You know, you've always got to come in hot and let uh, everybody yeah, yeah. know where you're from straight out the gate, you know, like lekker or how's it. <laughs> No, I don't normally say that with such aggression too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it cool. was a little bit aggressive, but that you know that's also typical South African. So it's all it's all good, man. <laughs> yeah, I know, full aggression all the time. But now I got my hazard out and my lacquer, so good stuff. What's no, happening, guys? Ah, uh, uh, cool, man. But oh, you got a nice big <laughs> smile there, and uh, we're really looking forward to chatting to you today. Um, I just wanted to quickly sort of start off with uh, you know, like I guess social media gets a bit of a bad rap these days, but actually we find that it actually really actually helps us in terms of our podcast and how we get to know people and how I got to find out about you was actually pretty cool. A common friend of ours, uh, Doug Hodges Williams, who I actually went to primary school with and I haven't seen since pretty oh, much. Nice. Um, he shared your video of something really cool that you've been doing lately. And I saw it and I was like, geez, Doug, this is cool. I, do you know Travis at all? And he's like, yeah, I know him well. And you know, I said, can you connect me? And he's like, yeah, no worries. And then I guess the rest is history. So here we are. We're chatting with you today. So thanks for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Yeah, no, all good, man. Great to be here. Thanks to Doug. Uh, yeah. You know, so he's a good guy. And uh, yeah, I've known him for the best part of my adult life now. We actually shared a room together in our first um, like national competition, we were roomies because I won like the Cape Town um, leg and he won the Joburg leg. So we were like pretty important. So they gave us our own special room and, and that's where I met him. And actually, <laughs> we've been great friends since. Uh, that's really cool, man. Uh, well, cool well, I, yeah, well, I've, I've, I guess you to thank and both of you to thank because I actually had a, about an hour chat with him the other night just doing a bit of like, you know, guest research and stuff. And it was just cool to connect. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, he's a top guy. And, uh, you know, you'll find whenever you speak to him, he's also always coming in hot with uh, the aggressive house it. And <laughs> the blacker too. You know, maybe yeah. I learned it from him, actually. Yeah, I know. He, <laughs> he definitely pulled out a few the other nights, which was nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you guys find the same when you're, like, overseas. Um, I've, I do it all the time when I'm competing overseas. I always... I, I like really, I lay it on thick. Like I said, <laughs> I'm like running around the house. I probably don't sound that bad, but I grew up in Joburg and my wife always says that to me, you know, it's like, wow, you just, you sound so normal. And then all of a sudden you're like talking like Joburg yes. and yeah. you're getting this, the like boys. Out, you know, <laughs> the voice, you know, and, and even when I present, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to put like 15 mils of fresh lime juice. That's how I normally speak. And I'll be like, no, I'm going to put like 15 mils of fresh lime juice. <laughs> <laughs> He's always, like, he's always teasing me about it because for some reason, I don't know, when I get into a space where there's other people from around the world, I almost want them to know, you know, like how proud I am to be South African and I get a little, awesome. 
South African out, you know, so, and she always teases me about it. But um, yeah, I don't know if you guys do that as well at the it's same a game time. face. You, you're connecting with your, your alter ego, like your, 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 your South Joburg. Uh, yeah, like, I know, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and I always bring it out. And then like you know, very few people actually get it, unfortunately. <laughs> That's always like, Yo, hey, oh no, where are you from? Are you from Australia? It's like, <laughs> like the number one, oh. number one country I get um, like mis uh, informed about. It's like, yo, no, you mostly from Australia. It's like, whoa, no, 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 Hang no. On a sec. Yeah. <laughs> but I get a bit of that. I get a lot of New Zealand. Um, yeah. And I get some from, oh, no, you from the UK. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I speak English as a first language. <laughs> so I don't know. Well, yeah, but always the Australians is like, oh, no, really, Australia? Because I don't even think it's even similar. No, it's not. No, we, likewise. We, yeah, we had the same thing. We were in America early on this year, and I think 95% of people went, so where in Australia are you from? And we were like <laughs> rolling our eyes going, you know what? <laughs> we're from Brisbane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just go with it, yeah. And, and, and oh, yeah. Do you ever pull out Chinas and things like that these days? You, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, China. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a staple. You know, lacquer, yeah. how's it? And then, and then China. But I can only say it uh, to to people who know what that is. You know, because obviously yeah, it's yeah. typical South African thing. So not everybody knows what that is. But what I do find though is that when I'm overseas, as soon as somebody finds out you're from South Africa, then they will rip out the China first. So, <laughs> like, where are you from? You know, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. That's the first thing they say. Oh, how's it, my China? You know, like, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, That's so oh, true. Like, okay, cool. Now, so you've met another South African before, and they, they maybe taught you three things, and one of them was China. <laughs> and I know what the yeah. other two were. was how's it and lekker. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's funny because um, when I first moved to the UK, I, I started playing Australian rules football, and it was me. I think I was almost one of the only South African guys, and I was fresh off the boat. And it was like, you had 80 guys at training and I was calling everyone China. Like, oh, <laughs> and these Aussie Oaks, you know, they love nicknames. And, and literally since then, my nickname has been China. So that's how China, people yeah. in London. They're like, China, China. I'm like, yep. Okay. It's yep. my nickname now. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. 20 years. <laughs> yeah. China. No, I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. do, you know, do you know where it actually comes from though? I think so. I think it's rhyming slang, isn't it? It's like China plate. China plate That's my isn't understanding. It? Yeah. That's so it's like it's like a take on Cockney. Like you know, apples and pears and Cockney is like stairs, and like mustard yeah. is can be trusted. And yeah. um, <laughs> and I don't know how we got into the whole Cockney thing, but we then took it one step further for like China, China plate mate. Yeah. So yeah. instead of calling somebody your mate, you call them your China. China plate mate so yeah well no (laughs) actually it's I mean China plate is actually proper cockney though that's what they used to that's what they still use in like East London and stuff so it's um they I think the the Poms brought it over to South Africa when they were like you know you know when they were coming in there all that sort of stuff yeah Yeah. coming in Uh, out (laughs) yeah coming in out do they do it for like um uh, for mate as well is that what it is yeah, my, yeah, yeah, definitely. But not, I mean, you don't really hear much these days, but, um, but they do do yeah, it for, yeah. they do do it for mates. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I can <laughs> so we all know now where, where that comes from. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's I mean, already some value in this podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> if it's people didn't know, China. yeah, if people didn't know about South Africa and our, our slang and stuff, they know now. So that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool, man. So let, let's kick yeah. this off. Um, Let's take this back like a little bit to the beginning, right? Uh, life got off, I guess, to a challenging start for yourself. Uh, you had a sort of very um, tough bone um, disease. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. you, that you, I don't know if you were born with it or, um, if, yeah, or how it came uh, along, but maybe you can take us back, tell us a bit about that and kick off from there. Yeah, so I was born in Zim, actually. So when you said you got off to a rough start, I thought maybe you were referring to that, but it wasn't so bad back <laughs> in the olden days. And uh, then we moved to South Africa when I was, I was, I wasn't even one yet, so call it 1981. And uh, yeah, maybe about, I was like nine months old or something like that. And I, I, I contracted a very hectic um, bone marrow disease. It was like this thing called osteomyelitis it was eating away my bone marrow. And at that time, like not too many people had ever even heard of this disease before. So they had a tough time treating it because they didn't know what it was and they didn't know how to cure it. 
so I was almost like the uh, like the poster boy or like the guinea pig for this kind of of, of procedure. And uh, yeah, I mean, I lived with it all the way up until I was about ten years mm -hmm. old. Was probably my last memory of going in for a procedure to get the um, pus drawn out. And um, yeah, basically, it was something. I, I don't know how I contracted it. My mom told me the story about how I contracted it through my nose. I a, a sunburn on the on the front flap of my nose and I, I was obviously it turned into a scar and I was picking it a lot hmm. and then it began to to bleed and then it, it began to get infected and weirdly enough um, it manifested itself not on my face as I was uh, having this infected nose but it manifested itself in my ankle in my left leg hmm. and so my, my ankle and my left leg swelled like a, like a watermelon and my mom was like okay this is definitely not normal so she took me to the doctor and um, they just said it was a bad infection of some kind and they basically cut me open and they just squeezed out all of the pus and gunk and then they sewed me up and then off I went. But um, they didn't actually cure it because like a month later it would swell up again. Same thing, a month later it would swell up again and it, it took them a couple of months to figure out what to do with my, with my leg. It wasn't um, until a guy named Dr. Lotto. It's like amazing how you remember people's names when they're important in your life. But he had the same disease in his hip. Hmm. And he had been doing some research back of house and he found out um, this amazing way of making what looked like a beaded necklace filled with like medicine or muti in these beads. And um, he cut me open and he laid a track down my tibia, tibia um, filled with this like necklace with these beads. And um, it was like a slow releasing antidote or medicine that, that basically killed the infection over a period of time so that it never came back and never came back. And uh, eventually, uh, when I was maybe somewhere in my first year of approaching two, they got to a point now where I wasn't being operated on so often. It did manifest itself, as I said, all the way till I was about 10 years old, mm. but not, nothing, as, nothing as hectic, nothing as big. So, um, I mean, when I used to go for my uh, checkups um, after that, I was never um, put, put under, like, under general anesthetic like I was when I was a baby. So I was a little bit older and they would just locally anesthetize the area and they would just squeeze the, the pus out, not through my um, tibia anymore, but um, either through my knee or through the top part of my shin, shin bone. And uh, yeah, as I say, it was maybe about 10 when I actually stopped going. It never, never really happened mm. after that. I don't even know if it's still ever going to happen. I don't think so. I mean, I'm so past that point in my life right now and it seems like everything is fine and, and, and there's nothing really... Um, to show for it except for one massive scar on my leg and the fact that my tibia bone is a little bit gaunt because it was eaten away a little bit so it's a bit looks a bit funny but um, it didn't affect me in any way whatsoever I mean it would have um, uh, until Dr. Lotta got involved they were actually going to amputate was the next uh, the next thing if they couldn't con contain it they were just going to amputate me just below the knee wow. um, yeah, I know, which would have sucked uh, quite hardcore because I ended up playing decent football and, and I wouldn't have been able to do any of that sort of stuff uh, later on in life. But uh, the risk was because it was, a, it was an infection that was sort of growing. So it went from my tibia, it would have eventually gone up my leg and into my, um, what is it, your femur, femur leg. Yeah, and then eventually would have gone into my hip and then eventually my spine and then, you know, who knows what would have happened from there. So... So uh, to prevent it from spreading, if they couldn't contain it, they were going to chop me just below the knee. But they never did that, thankfully. And uh, I still have my leg and I've never really uh, affected me whatsoever. I mean, I sprinted in school. I broke school records. I was like junior Victor Ladorum and senior Victor Ladorum. I was like a thing that I could run and only because I'm so skinny. And, uh, and you know, I played decent football as well, like well into my, into my 30s. You know, and uh, I can't play now because my knee got pretty pretty gaunched on, a, on an obstacle course and I'm like recovering now 18 weeks post off on that but it's not anything to do with my lower leg but it was a pretty scary time for my parents I mean I don't really remember it all I yeah. know is, is, is this massive scar on my leg and I remember going back for these like really remedial um, uh, what do they call it operations but procedures where they used to squeeze a lot of pass mm. out, of, out of my leg it's just a weird thing like I've, I've come to notice about myself that there must be something about my immune system that is not normal because 
if I get a scar or a graze on my knee or, 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 or when I used to slide tackle a lot in football, you get grazes, uh, so your upper thigh. And whenever I did that, I, I used to get these boils and bumps that would manifest itself in other parts of my leg, not at the area where I was injured, you know? Mm. And it's just like, it's like your body trying to take away all of these germs and stuff, you know? And I constantly get boils in weird, weird places, you know, like on my elbows and knees. And every time I get, if I get a cut on my hand, for instance, I know for sure that I'm going to get swelling in my groin. That's the mm. first thing that happens. And then after that, I'll get a big boil somewhere in my lower body, like on, on one of my legs. Hmm. And it's just, it's just the way that I am. It's like very strange. And I'm telling you this stuff, like it's normal. And uh, I don't know how normal it is, but it's normal for me. Like I'm not known any other way. And this seems to be a way which my body deals with that kind of thing, you know? It's wow. interesting. Well, you know, if, if you're saying this, you can be very sure there's a few hundred other people out there that are, have going, are, are nodding their heads going, geez, I've had that too. I can't, but you know what I mean? There's, there's always, yeah. uh, the human body is so complex and everyone, you know, one thing I always learned at university is like, you know, there's the normal anatomy and the normal thing, but then they've always got the like, but don't forget this could also happen or this or this or <laughs> all the, yeah. the anomalies, you know, that, and then, and different ways. So, I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me the least. And at least, you know, your body now well, and it's good that you like that you healed so well, but as a kid, did you like, when you spoke about having swelling and stuff like that, did, I mean, it must've affected you as a youngster. I mean, did, did other kids ever like tease you or did they ever look at you and go like, what, what's going on there and, and look at you any differently? Yeah, I know. Well, I think I was teased, but yeah, it was like a thing, you know, like uh, what's happening with that leg of yours type of vibe, you know? And, uh, you know, when you, when I was younger, younger at the height of it, it used to swell a lot. But um, when I was older and I'm in school now, um, it didn't swell like that. I mean, it, it, mm. it was just like the front of my shin bone. It looked like maybe I'd, I've been in like a Muay Thai fight and I got like a <laughs> kick in my leg, you know, and then it swelled like a big bruise. Um, but there was no bruising, obviously. It's just a weird swelling, you know, and you can tell um, like your skin around that area is like under pressure. So it looks like it's not even your own skin kind of thing, you know. And that's when we knew, okay, well, look, you know, you're going to have to go and get that, you know, taken away, you know. So... I remember when I was younger, my mom used to have this uh, ointment called Traxa, which is like a withdrawing type of ointment. And uh, people that get splinters a lot, if you put Traxa on, it draws the, uh, the splinter out. And um, still to this day, my mom panics about it all the time. Um, she is on high alert that it could happen again. You know, so she's been living like this for well over 30 years, worried about my leg and about my immune system and stuff. But, um, we used to have this tracks and we used to put this tracks on and it would uh, normally draw the pus out and then I wouldn't have to go and get it actually cut open. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was normally either that and it was a quick fix. So you, you, you learn to actually understand when it's serious and not serious. And then um, if it was too serious and the tracks wasn't getting all of that out, then we would go, the swelling was too big and then I'd get a little a quick incision and then the doctor would just squeeze it all out and sew me up and, or if I'd go again, but no, I didn't get much teasing. No, weirdly enough. And I, when I was younger, maybe I don't know the area I grew up in Norwood in, in Joburg, they weren't, uh, weren't nasty kids. I suppose nasty kids everywhere, but um, they were more compassionate, really. You know, like, oh my gosh, you know, this guy, what's happening? You know, so mm. they were nice, they were sweet kids. You know, you know, Joburg kids are sweet, or well, they were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. You didn't buddy. use Zambuck, my man. That's, that reminded me of Zambuck. That, uh, yeah, man, it's very similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tractor it was like in a little green thing. It looked exactly the same. It opened in the same way. It had the same sort of gelatinous feel to it. So it was very, very similar. It just had a different smell, obviously, because Zambuck, I mean, you'll know Zambuck's got that hectic camphor and, and you can just smell it. And this didn't. This had a very, very funky smell. It was, uh, I, I, I mean, to this day, if you bring that near me, I know exactly what it is. Yeah. It's a smell that will never leave you. That kind of smell, you know, and I can't really yeah. explain what it smells like. Um, it smells almost like a cardboard box, like a fresh cardboard box. <laughs> like, I mean, so many of us are just grabbing cardboard boxes and sniffing them, you know, but um, <laughs> uh, that's, that's probably what it smelled like, something like that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And, and but you, you touched on your, your folks there and your, and your mom and was it, do you, does she talk about it much? Was it like quite an emotional time for them? Was it like a bit of a struggle, you know, emotionally and, and potentially financially as well at all? 
I mean, I don't know about the financial side. You know, when you're younger, your parents always guard you for that sort of thing. I know that we didn't have it all our own way. Uh, things went up and down. Sometimes, you know, it was really good and sometimes it was really bad. And I think that's just normal for anybody, really. But um, emotionally, it did affect her. And um, I know she, she, she speaks about it a lot, even now, given my current knee problems that I'm having. Yeah, you know, we still always say, look, you must tell the doctor about your uh, leg and about your immune system and about your bones and so that he understands, you know, uh, obviously the first thing they see when, when I go for anything knee or leg operated is like, wow, what is that on your leg? Because it's not a, it's not a neat scar. It's like scars that they mm -hmm. used to make in like the early 80s. Mm -hmm. They're big, really, really big. So... Um, it's normally just a thing like, what is that? You know, like, uh, you mm. know, and I have to explain the whole thing um, to them. And yeah, and no, I think with my mom, my mom's going to be um, exactly like a mom is going to be. They always worry about their children and especially their youngest. And I think maybe when I was younger, I was just very frail, uh, mm. you know, because of it, you know, and it was always like, no, Travis can't go in the sun and, you know, uh, Travis can't jump off the walls because his, you know, his legs will break, you know, they won't break, but, that's how it was always like that, you know. So my brother got away with a lot more than I did. You know, he was uh, a lot more cavalier um, mm -hmm. and a lot, uh, he still is to this day, a lot more cavalier than I am. And because of it, maybe I'm a little bit um, uh, cautious about life and about, you know, where I can do and what I can step on and stuff like that. And I think it's because of her, because she was always like that. Of course, my dad's like, nah, he's fine. Go, oh, you know, jump, jump off the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do that sort of thing. But but my mom has always been very um, very worried about it, and very protective, and she still is to this day. As I say, I'm going for my knee up now. It's like, hey, 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 tell them, tell them, tell them. You know, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, speaking about your older brother Sheldon, um, he's obviously the more cavalier one, and what have you, due to circumstances. But is uh, are you were you guys close growing up? Did you have a bit of like um, sibling rivalry or anything like that uh, at all? No, no. I mean, we, we were very close growing up and we still are very close. Um, so I feel very fortunate like that. I've got a lot of friends who have brothers and they, they don't even speak to them. They don't really see them. In fact, some of their relationships are really under pressure. You know, it's not even, oh, I don't really speak to my brother. It's just like, yeah, I don't even like my brother. So mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So sibling rivalry is something that you have to worry about. But um, as far as my older brother was concerned, when it came to me, he, he, he very... Um, like he doted over me a lot as an older brother. Yeah, he doted over me like, like an older brother would. So um, he was always concerned about me. And later on in life, he actually became um, my biggest fan, actually. So there was no like, um, oh, he got that or I got that or anything like that. He was always very much uh, concerned about me. And, you know, he always wanted the best for me. So whenever I flay or compete or whenever I'm on TV or whatever the case may be, he's always there, you know, and he's always in the front row and he's always, he speaks very glowingly of, of me. He's obviously along with my parents, very, very proud. And, um, yeah, he's never, ever, uh, been anything other than the, you know, the, the quintessential big brother sort of holding his little brother and pulling him along when we were younger, actually it was quite weird because, um, I never used to call him by his name weirdly enough, because when you grow up, you learn, you know, this is my mom. I call her mom, this is my dad, I call him dad, this is my brother, I must call him brother then, obviously. So <laughs> up until about the age of about maybe eight or so, I didn't refer to him as Sheldon, I called him brother the cool. whole time. <laughs> and, cool. Yeah, and it wasn't until um, around about eight years old where we were in school and we were, you know, people were like saying it was a bit weird <laughs> you know, that you called him <laughs> brother, you know, like... And then, and then I think he had a quiet word for me. It's like, okay, Travis, you know, I think you're old enough now to know that, you know, you, don't call me <laughs> brother. you know, you call mom, mom and dad, dad, but I'm, I'm Sheldon. You can call me Sheldon. And when we were really, really younger, he used to walk with his um, arm around me. When we walked wherever we walked, I remember I was at Kyle Army racetrack and he was showing me all the bikes and I was really keen and looking at it and whatever. And obviously I had my arm reciprocated around him, you know, and uh, as we were walking, um, two other older boys walked past us and I remember the one shouting out um, like a he didn't swear but he basically he, he inferred to us that we were an, a couple or an item or that you know we were not brothers type of thing you know like yeah. and it was weird for boys to put their arms around each other like that you know and um, 
even though my brother defended us straight away, he was like, this is my brother. This is my little brother. You know, um, later on that night, he said to me, like, we, you know, we're not going to walk like that, uh, you know, anymore because now people are, they're going to take it the wrong way um, kind of thing. And then that was the end of that as well. And there was also around about that time. So I kind of lost the whole calling him brother thing. I lost the whole embrace thing as well. And uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, I don't know. When they're older, maybe kids can get a little bit cruel, you know, and then yeah, yeah. I didn't even know what they were talking about, as actually, you know, it's like, of course, my brother, you know, he's you know, yeah, yeah, fights, you know, like, what's the big deal, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, it's really sad, actually. Bit sad, yeah, yeah, that, that happened, yeah. You know, like, yeah, 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 sorry about that. I didn't mean it to sound like so sad. I mean, he holds me like that now, now, he no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, that I'm, age, I'm isn't the it? same. Yeah. yeah, there was that like odd sort of age, you know, but I mean, now we are hug him, he hug me, we do whatever we want, you know, and nobody yeah. says anything like that anymore. It's just when you're young, you don't really understand. Exactly. So it was a bit unfortunate. I'm sorry to take that to a downsy area. No, 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 it's no, cool. no, 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 that's, that's like, but that's exactly it. Like, like these are the kind of questions you think, why does that actually happen? And I guess you, you, it's, you understand it. it's a, a, an age where you sort of uh, care what other people think a lot more. And then you, I suppose you get past that and then now you're like, cool, I'm going to hug my brother as much as I want because I don't exactly. care anymore. You know what people think. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's where we are right now, you know, because we know we have a very special bond and we're super tight. And uh, you know what, if, if he wants to kiss me on my forehead or cheek in the yeah. middle of the shopping center, then, you know, you can go right ahead and, and, and do whatever you want, you know? Yeah. It's only when you're younger. I don't know why maybe it's a competitive thing. If, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, cool. It's nice. And you now you have a real proper bromance going on there. That's, that's yeah, 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 we do. Well, we do. We do indeed. And uh, the, the nice thing about it is that I have kids now. So um, yeah. he's now their uncle. And so it was actually my son's uh, birthday on Saturday. And we're talking about what uh, my brother's going to get him. And, you know, behind the scenes, we're finding all of these like uh, things that uh, he's going to buy for him. And we're on WhatsApp sending photos of like shirts and stuff. And I just, it's lo lovely like i love yeah. having mm. parts of my family family and my now family like mm. connected in such a way you know that's really nice mm. but and but so so just taking it a little bit back oh back again uh so you went to highlands north boys is that right and that's um correct. yeah right in school yeah yeah actually i think my dad actually also went to highlands north boys and and i know it was oh, wow. it was generally a fairly rough school back in the day wasn't it yeah, it was. I mean, when your dad went, probably not as bad as when I got there. Um, yeah, there was always this talk about the school sort of preceding when we got there, that it was a, a good school. And um, it was like down the road from King Edward's mm. high school. And Kez's was known as like the school of the area. You know, it was a good rugby school, you know, good at everything, sports, whatever. If you wanted to further yourself in life, you went there. You know, Graham Smith went there. The Brian Banner went there. <laughs> you know that, that 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 sort of thing so um we always had this thing like in the olden days we used to compete against cares you know we used to play against cares and we we're like oh right oh no cool then we must have been really really good but by the time i got to that school we did still play against cares but like their c team and their d <laughs> you know yeah. so um yeah it was a yeah it was a rough school i mean i uh, i mean i loved it i absolutely loved it but um in hindsight i, I wouldn't have have gone there you know my father was very um uh he was very keen to send me to another school like st john's or cares or one of the other much better schools in the, in the area but um my older brother went there sheldon and i just went where he went really and i stupidly should have listened to my father because i would have done way better um in another school setup than i did there you know, it just was a <clears throat> it was a bit of a yeah, I don't know. It's a bit of a rough school. I mean, I'll give you an example of the type of people that went there. Do you know who Adam Katsavalos is? Uh, no, don't. The name's not familiar. So I went to primary school with this guy and also high school. And uh, about maybe three or four months ago, there was a big thing. Maybe you, you guys didn't catch it there of a guy on a beat in Greece, like uh, giving a weather report where he was like saying, hey, guys, check that way I'm on holiday. In oh, Greece. yes. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. That guy, he went to my school. He was in a standard above me. He was in my brother's standard. And the racist, that whole racist thing. That whole racist thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So now that guy, he was in my school. He was in my brother's uh, class. 
you know, and, and this is the type of people that went there. They were rollers, brawlers, yes. you know, like whenever we went to uh, play rugby in other people's schools, always got into fights. It was embarrassing because, you know, of course, if something little scuff happens on the field and whatever, everybody left the benches and the grandstand <laughs> to go running on like a, just like, <laughs> a weird, weird thing. You know, and I was a very timid kid when I was younger. I didn't understand that it was very, uh, shocking, you know, like, uh, and, 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 and when I went to that sort of school, it was like a, a system whereby timid kids are really put down and, um, you know, people call you funny names. I remember one boy telling me, uh, telling my brother when I, I'd met my brother in one of the hallways because my mom had given us each tuck money and, uh, I used to go and get my tuck money from him because obviously I would lose it if he wasn't keeping it up until the very time we needed to use it. So <laughs> I would find him in like the period before break time, first break and, and, and meet up with him and get, and get my tuck money. And I remember another boy walking past and I just joined the school. So it was like, uh, is this your brother, Sheldon? You know, they don't say Sheldon either, you know, cause we're in Joburg now, so it's Sheldon. <laughs> is this your brother, Sheldon? Is this your brother, Sheldon? You know, it's like, oh, this is my brother. Like, oh, he's so lucky. He's so lucky. <laughs> now look, look in those days, man, he's ugly, you know, like, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I didn't consider myself to be like a, a, an ugly dude. I didn't consider myself to be in the donors either. But I, it, irrespective you know, of what I was, it's just so odd to have someone so openly say that to you, you know. And uh, I remember from that point on, obviously, Sheldon was very much like, oh, no, it's my brother, man. You know, like, like he normally is. And obviously, that guy um, left and went away. But even as, as hard as my brother was as a human, he was in like the school where, he, you know, he was only average compared to like all of the people that were there. You know, and uh, so he had a tough time as well because I was always getting flack from um, older kids in that school, not uh, because I was special, but because that's just what you did. You know, like yeah. you're a standard eight, so you give the grief to the standard sevens and standard sixes, you know, and this is how it was until you get to like be, be the king in the trick. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I that, that kind of school, when I left it, uh, that's when I started to realize that I didn't enjoy it. You know, I enjoyed it while I was there and I never ever once while I was in school said, Oh, this school's not for me. But when I left, I, I remember thinking that that kind of system of, of, of like popular kids trying to be more popular by putting non-popular kids down that whole system. Um, I just, I really didn't enjoy it. And later on in my life, when I realized how silly that is and how it doesn't apply in your real life, in your jobs mm -hmm. and, and your life going forward um then then, then I, I started to really loathe that system you know that that whole way of being and uh, i started to look for encouragement in other areas of life i remember when i was in um standard six our deputy head boy his name was jonathan chefs he was a like a really mountain of a man you know he was a monster of a man and uh actually when i met him after school now he was in matric uh, and he was our deputy head and when i was in senate six i saw this guy and i thought to myself oh my gosh look at this he's amazing you know he's big and strong and all the sort of things and then i saw him when i had finished matric and he's like two heads shorter than me and, <laughs> you know and, and, and you're just like oh wow you know like uh, and and um that was an encouraging part for me because you know, i realized that you know in school and in that system that you're in you know you are bound by bigger kids and whatever but when you mm. get, become older you know and it doesn't matter what you do or where you are or any of those sort of things everybody is sort of normal you know and your size doesn't even matter in fact it's, it's not even a thing anymore it's even smaller than you now you know? <laughs> yeah. um and uh yeah so highlands uh and even to this day when i tell other people that i went to highlands i don't say i went to highlands i went to highlands <laughs> and uh, Everybody knows, oh my gosh, he went to Harlem. So now, you know, give him a, give him a wild, wide bird. That's oh, a classic. Uh, it's classic. I can imagine there must have been some uh, fairly brutal initiations and stuff. It's like, it's for sports and stuff like that at a school like that as well. I mean, at those days in South Africa, there was initiation anyway, but I can imagine there was pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, but, there um, was something else. Because it was a boys' school, obviously. So, you know, you yeah. don't tell, you don't say, you don't whatever. Yeah. But you're always home with something weird. I remember coming home with a bruise on my leg from an egg that someone had thrown a hard boiled egg. And this was part of our initiation. Basically the standard sixes had made like this little round circle up against the volleyball pole made out of like nests, like twigs and things. 
And, uh, you know, part of your initiation to come into the school was to go through that ring, like the ring of fire, you know, and the, all the matrix were waiting on the other side with these eggs. And we were obviously waiting on the other side. And they were like, come, 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 come through this ring, you know. And uh, I remember none of us obviously wanted to go through the ring because you know, you were, you know the first one was going to get hit really, really hard, you know. And uh, I remember standing there and I was just waiting for the matrix to sort of lose interest in us, you know. And I saw my gap and I just bolted. I was the quickest kid. Anyway, I knew that. And I just bolted. I ended up Superman diving straight through that thing. And by the time they realized that I'd come in, they were like, you know, chops, chops, chops. Yeah, they come, here they come. You know? and, uh, and when I got up on the other side, uh, they started firing the eggs and thankfully only one hit me. Uh, so I got off reasonably okay. But the one that did hit me hit me on my inner leg. And uh, oh. as I was running away and I went home, obviously with a, a bruise, but it was like blue and then it was yellow and then it was purple. It was like an odd, odd, <laughs> odd And then of course, when your mom sees that sort of thing, she started oh. freaking out. You know, what is this? And this initiation... Why, why did he do this? You know, she does obviously doesn't understand it. And it was obviously in my leg as well. So she was super yeah. about it. Of course. Yeah. Well, my, I must say like that my dad was at Kez actually. And uh, he's also got his uh, fair amount of stories that uh, of the, you know, competing sports against, you know, Park Town and, and Highlands yeah. and these kind of things and back in the day. It was big rivalry, wasn't it? So, after yeah. just moving on a little bit later, after you'd finished school and what have you, you found yourself eventually down um, in Cape Town and you started working at uh, Le Med uh, as a barman. And uh, maybe you could just start off a little bit with explaining a little bit more about uh, what Le Med is. And, uh, you know, it has to be uh, one of the greatest bars pretty much in the world, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, when I worked, it was a, an institution. You know, it wasn't like uh, you can't be any geek off the street and come and work at Le Med. I mean, you had to cut your teeth in some other bar uh, for years before you got your crack at, at a place like that. But, um, you know, I uh, after I moved to Cape Town, uh, which was just four days after matric, my parents relocated here and I, we came down to Cape Town. And, you know, my dad was pretty, um, pretty hardcore about that whole, look, you finished school now thing, you know, and you've you got to go out and pay your way, you know. And... Uh, you know, I didn't really know what to, to do. You know, I ended up, uh, I, I went to a, a, a steak ranch, like around the corner from my house and asked them for a job as a waiter, um, which I, they said, yeah, cool, come in. I think I did like two uh, training shifts or whatever. And then my actual shift, I think I lasted like three hours. And then I took my apron off. I went in and I said, look, guys, I just, I really, I just don't think this, this is going to work out for me. You know, like and I left the shift like midway, midway through. And a uh, very odd thing for me because I don't normally do um, that sort of thing. It's not my, it's not my vibe, but I really, really, really knew that I wasn't cut out uh, for, for, for that kind of work. But my brother had gone on and got a job as a bartender along with a friend of his um, working in a very cool uh, cocktail bar called Fab Cafe. And they were um, like expressing themselves with flaring and stuff. They used to come home to my house and put like carpets down inside the house because it made such a noise when you dropped the bottles and um, they would like just throw these bottles around. It was such a weird thing because I wasn't doing anything myself. And then when I came into the room and I saw them throwing these bottles around, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Like, look at how cool this is, you know, like, and I thought, well, you know, I've got to, I've got to do that. You know, I've got to be able to do that and, and do it better than you guys at least. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I'm not going to get you know, noticed, you know, so I ended up um, getting involved in that like quite hectically. I mean, there was no real reason to do that. I mean, um, the, the competitions weren't like prevalent. There was no um, uh, system or association or club that you could join. It was just literally you on your own with your brother in the garden, flinging these empty bottles around, you know? And um, I, uh, I basically ended up getting a job uh, working there at Fab Cafe as a bartender because my brother said, look, you know, to the guys, my brother and whatever, whatever. And I, I got in there for a little bit and then I sort of outgrew that place very, very quickly. And, uh, I went and applied at Le Med like a hero thinking I'm the <laughs> man. Um, Oh, that's what happened. Oh yeah. So, so a, a, like a, an, an invite to a flare competition came across the bar because obviously they would just send it to all the bars saying, if any of your bartenders want to uh, compete or enter into this competition and if they can flare, 
you know, you can win 5,000 Rand. And uh, <laughs> I was like, 5,000 Rand? Yeah, and wow. We talk, yeah, we're talking about like, um, like the turn of the, of, the, of the millennium, you know, it's like 5,000 Rand was a lot. So I was like, no, I've got to be involved here. And I was already practicing every day for, for what? I don't know. But as it turned out, I was practicing for something like this, you know, like, <laughs> and I entered it, uh, I went entered it into the rookie division and, uh, and I won it. And I was just like, wow, I can't believe it. Wow. I mean, I entered in the rookie division and I didn't even know like the level um, of the other guys that were there. As it turned out, they said that I, I should have entered the pro uh, division and won mm -hmm. that. Hmm. But I didn't, know. you know, I didn't, nice. I only entered the rookie because I don't know who you people are and what you can do. I expect you to do way more than that. And after I won that, then things really radically changed for me. Like YouTube was kicking in now and uh, I went hardcore there and I started to see a whole bunch of um, videos about how to do it. And I practiced every day on my own, apart from just being in the bar. I would then get back to Lamed because I'd won that competition. I had like some sort of confidence in me. So I just showed up at the best cocktail bar in in cape town and said oh hey you know like here's my certificate because they give you a certificate of winning obviously and i said hey you know i'm travis and i won this play competition and i like to work here and the guy said cool no problem um come back for a test shift or, or whatever and i came back for the test shift and then the bar manager said to the general manager like apparently this guy can play show us a couple of moves or whatever and i, I did like a three minute set for this dude and they were like whoa oh my gosh <laughs> now you were hired you know Cool. And uh, and I ended up working there for about two and a half, maybe three, call it call it three years. Absolute jaw. Like um, <laughs> I didn't know that I was going to become a professional bartender from that point out. You know, I was kind of keeping my options open for whatever my real gig was going to be. Um, but yeah, I suppose maybe the nature and of my personality is to not really engage anything halfway. I was going to give it a full go no matter what. You know, and uh, I ended up just competing from then on out. I remember the first sort of four competitions that I entered in my early days, I won all of them. Wow. And I just, yeah, I know, which was quite weird, you know, because, you know, when I had started, uh, then the association started, then the competition started to come up. So it was almost like, uh, like the planets had aligned in such a mm. way that, you know, uh, you know, I, you know I, I say I won them all, but it was operating for a very small base. I mean, there weren't many people doing it, you know, so you had to beat like maybe a field of seven other guys who could base break or do some roll or palm spin. And there you are rocking like three objects, you know, two tins in a bottle. And they were just like, oh my gosh. And I think it was probably the best thing that I ever did was to go onto YouTube and take all of those moves and all of those things that I saw on YouTube because nobody was doing that. They were just developing on their own. <laughs> And uh, I was developing on an international level and they were sort of still local. So whenever I competed mm -hmm. against them, I was, you know, a sort of up, up a level you know, on them. But Lamed was, I mean, an amazing time. I totally enjoyed it. I don't know, have, you, have, you, have either one of you guys been to, to Lamed? Yeah, lots I mean, of times. <laughs> I mean, it's a total, total institution. It's like uh, Sunday yeah. nights, they're obviously the mm -hmm. biggest, biggest nights. We used to get there three in the afternoon and cut all your fruits and prep your bar to open at five. Um, then it opens at five and from five o'clock sundowners people are in there and we're talking about 2000 people in a, in a cocktail mm -hmm. bar. So it's unheard of. And they are basically pushing the, the bar down, um, to get drinks from you. Um, and to be dead honest, if I had to, uh, be uh, brutal about it, the drinks that we made in that place were shocking compared to the drinks that we make now. And uh, it was all about to show, you know, you spend like five minutes to make a Tasmanian devil, a poorly made Tasmanian devil. <laughs> you know, they were average tasting drinks when you, you know, you know, when you were meticulous and being uh, caring about, it. but when you weren't caring about the drink and like busting all these moves and whatever, but people, they just didn't really care. It was all about the show and shots. <laughs> and they got this really poorly made cocktail, which they probably put into a down, down glass and downed it anyway. Does that really like hardcore speed bar, you know, and just, what a fantastic bar to cut your teeth, you know, because yeah. you learn so much in that, in, under that environment. And I can't even think of another bar uh, in South Africa right now where you can learn those kinds of skills, you know, mm. amazing place, amazing time. I enjoyed it. And I was young, you know, as well. I was like in my early twenties. So, you know, fair game. Everything was fair game, you know? Of course. Of course. Yeah. I've got so many uh, cool memories of Lamed. Like not that I, I mean, I didn't live in South Africa since I was 18, but uh I would always make sure that when I came back and I went to Cape Town, I would, I would go there and I would always 
I would generally like bring people back with me from London and stuff like Aussie mates and you know other mates from around yeah. the world and I'd go we have to go to this bar you know and it was always yeah. a Sunday night like you said and they were like oh my god that's the best place I've ever been to in my life I was like I right. you, it's I know. cool it was. <laughs> yeah. I felt it was very sad when it closed down I don't even know why it did I mean that place was heaving when mm. I left it anyway you know so you know I suppose everything has its time you know yeah for sure Exactly, and, exactly. And, and a big Sunday sesh is, a, is sort of a, was a big thing but I like nowadays I guess as you get older you think good lord like a Sunday night you, who'd go out party you know <laughs> it's true I mean no Sundays it's like most places are like closed on a Sunday you know Sunday yeah. Monday is their weekend you know <laughs> but uh, I, I, it's weird that, that because they they basically saw a little gap there I remember they used to have bands come and play on a Sunday evening for sundowners and then it got really popular just for sundowners and then really busy. And then they started adding DJs after the live bands. Mm -hmm. And then that just sort of made the whole night go through to two in the morning, you know, and then everybody <laughs> sort of knew that you, you went to La Med on a Sunday night because it was live bands followed by DJs, you know, and you know, this, the, the sea is right there. The sun is setting. It's cocktails. Mm -hmm. you know, we wore those like florally beach shirts and, I mean, it was such a vibe. It was just really, really, really the coolest place I've ever worked uh, behind a bar, without a doubt. Uh, that's very cool. And and so I guess being on the other side of a bar, you probably see the best and worst in people. Um, do you have any stories like, you know, of, of kind of either that, you, that stand out at all? You mean from working the bar? Like, yeah, just uh, from behind, you know, you, I'm sure you you get like some abusive clients and you know because they're really hammered and then you also get some really cool ones that are you know they come all the time and stuff you know are there any memories that stand out at all no not really i mean i think uh, all the bad memories that i have from uh, serving people behind the bar kind of block block mm -hmm. those out um but uh, as you say i mean I'll, I'll give you i can count on both feet and both hands a number of rude people that i've served um, that mm -hmm. come to a bar and um, and they're all the same. And uh, as you say, like they're always carrying some part of their life that they're really grumpy about. And they've come there to mm. like get a little bit happy. And then of course the bartender is the, is the antagonist almost, you know, and I've got to give this guy grief now for, for some reason. But um, I don't know if it was my job upbringing or whatever, but I didn't stand for any of that nonsense. I was always very, um, uh, very hardcore on, on, on people that didn't have any decent manners behind a bar, you know, mm. and the bartenders, unfortunately, they always, they cop flack for being a bartender. You know, you're always mm. seen as like somebody who's got zero skill, somebody who didn't really succeed in any normal thing in life, whatever normal mm. is. And, and, you know, you ended up in a bar and uh, so you, you're beneath me kind of thing, you know, and uh, look, I mean, I, I never ever once chose the, 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 the bar because it was an, an easy route or a route that I, you know, because I didn't have something else that I could have done or, or, or whatever, you know, you, this was something that I, I did, you know, and uh, to be truthful, there were many things that I, I could have done uh, other than that, you know, I was even offered a professional uh, contract to play football hmm. um, at one stage, but because it was in hmm. the vision too, um, the money was, wasn't as much as I was making it tips behind the bar. Wow. <laughs> and uh, you know, you'd rather just play like a, a you know, league, uh, your, your local Tigerberg league football in the first team there and, and, and make uh, more bucks, you know? Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, I didn't choose uh, bartending because I was rubbish at life or because I had no skills, <laughs> you know, doing, doing any, anything else, you know? So I never ever saw myself um, deserved of someone's disdain for me because they thought that I was um, skillless, you know, especially when you're spending like three hours a day, you know, pre pre perfecting your craft, you know, like you're really dedicating your time. And I don't even know many professional sportsmen who dedicate that much of their time to do what they do, you know? Mm. And uh, because we never really got the respect, you know, sometimes from behind the bar, you would, you would give it almost as good as you got it, you know? And uh, this, I'll read you a million mm. um, uh, training manuals that say that the customer is always right. Mm. And, you know, it doesn't matter what they say, you know, you've got to do this and that and whatever. And I, I never, never ever approached bartending in that way you know i always thought look i am i'm a pro at what i do in fact you know i'm probably more learned at what i do than you are at whatever it is you do you know and you know i'm not gonna um, disrespect you because you're an accountant and you know i expect you not to disrespect me because 
I'm a bartender, you know, and if I, if I am me and you are you, you ask me for a drink and I make you a drink, then we're all good, you know, mm. but um, very, very, very few people um, like that, especially in my early years. Um, maybe now I see a lot of people like that because it's very obvious that you're not some clown who's just whipping a drink together on their first shift. Mm. But when you were sort of making your way, it was like, ah, oh, you know, look at this guy, you know, he's got nothing else in life. And, yeah, you know, when they order drinks, it's like uh, brandy. And then they look away, you know, and you're like, uh, you know, there are how many ways they are to serve brandy, you know, and you're like, <laughs> you know, you're standing there, you know, and then they'll look and then they'll see, you know, brandy, brandy, you know, and you're like, yes, yes. What about it? You know, and then like, like, oh, give me a brandy. And I'm like, okay, you want a shot of brandy? <laughs> you know, brandy and Coke, you know, like, what is it about the brandy that you want, you know? And, uh, and, and they almost always like that. As I say, especially in the beginning, it was such an unfortunate thing because, you know, we were in the beginning of professional bartending. You're trying to like lay down these foundations for people to recognize you as, as not a goof. Um, mm. But, you know, I always felt like I had this pick in my hand and I was, you know, gaining new ground, you know, mm. without, with, with very little help, you know. So um, maybe that did you know, make me a little bit more um, aggressive, you know, with my pick, I kind of waved at people saying, Hey, listen, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to lay down new ground here. You know, if you can just like be a bit more respectful and not trottle over the path that I'm just trailing now, that would be nice, you know? <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, sometimes it got really, really bad. You know, I mean, I remember somebody throwing a bottle of beer at me. Wow. Um, mm. uh, and these are you know, like, sometimes it can get like that, you know, in the med, it's like really busy. You're serving thousand people at once. And, you know what you, you know you do like sections like this sort of section is your section so you start on the left like a typewriter and you go ding until you hit the other end then there's obviously new customers on that side and you start all over again and i remember serving this one guy vinter glaga paid for the vinter glaga and off he disappeared and carried on about maybe 25 minutes later look up there's this guy again you know and he's like hey you know you mischanged me it's like what he's like no you, you didn't you short changed me by 10 rand I was like, Oh my gosh. Uh, sorry. I just, you know, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know to be, I wanted to say, to be honest, I don't even know who you are. Like, you know, when <laughs> I'm serving, serving people at that rate, you know, it's just blank blobs really of people. Yeah. And you're just remembering orders, you know? And the guy was like, no, no, you must give me my 10 Rand now. And I was like, look, I look sure. I mean, there's people waiting behind you, but if you really want to uh, debate this, I'll tell you that I don't, no, about your 10 rand you know if there was a problem then maybe you should have just highlighted it right then and there and then we could have seen yeah. that you, we were 10 rand short and then i would have just given it and no, no problem so i said well i'm telling you now i said oh well i mean you've gone away for 25 minutes now and now you're back again how do i know you didn't drop the 10 rand you know anyway so then he said no you must give it to me he was quite forceful about it and i said look guy i'm going to explain this to you i can't give you 10 rand out of the till right now because then I'm going to be 10 rand short and me and the other guy that's working on this till we have to then pay in or I can give you 10 rand out of the tips and then you'll see how much of a popular guy I'm going to be by digging my hand in the tip jar right now taking out 10 rand to give to you over the bar so um, he said so what does that mean so I said well the long and short of it is is like I'm sorry that you didn't get your 10 rand but if it was a problem you should have said it and if there's you know something I could have done about it then I would have but now it's too late he got so angry about that situation there that he took the bottle of beer that he was holding and just threw it at me right in the face. Whoa. What? Yeah. Yeah, I know. It was like, it was like a shock. Like, a, because you don't expect that kind of, that level of abuse, yeah. you know, yes. behind a bar. But even yourself, I mean, you're under stress. I mean, being in a bar is not like, Easy. I don't know. Yeah, it's not, you're not in, a, in, a, in an office. You're not like, it's um, like you're chilling and it's like cool yeah, yeah you're under you know pressure I mean? like, the whole time you know, it's a very you know, you're under duress it's a stressful situation you know, your knees hurt your feet hurt your lower back is burning yeah um, you know you've you've served probably two thousand drinks so far you still got another four thousand to yes. drink you know um so it's it, it's a it's a stressful situation so you know you yourself are not the best version of yourself you know what i mean you, yeah. you need, in that situation you need to speak to people and get the information get them their stuff and get them out of the way and get the new guys in, you know, because that's how you keep people happy. Because it's, even with this guy, they're all like, Oh dude, get out of the way. Cause obviously yeah. it's like mm. taking up a unit of people that could be getting served, you know? And uh, yeah, I remember that was behind, I was working outside bar at the meds um, and you know, probably my worst 
my worst time behind a bar. I mean, I've never really been attacked. <laughs> like so, so what happened afterwards? Like, what was the end result? Um, no, I mean, I, 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 when I took the shot in, in the face, I just jumped straight over the bar counter um, onto him. So he ended up landing straight, straight down uh, on the ground. And I was like literally on top of him now. And uh, with all of the ruckus and whatever, there's a lot of security detail, in, especially in the beer garden uh, at the med. And uh, two bouncers basically came and they were, were holding me and then they were holding him at the same time. And they were like, uh, what's going on here type of thing? I said, this guy, he threw a beer in my face. But of course, the um, security guys, you know them well. You work with them. Yeah. And they, are always, they are basically there to protect you. Yeah. So, I mean, as soon as I said that, they never even asked any questions or whatever. They just removed him from the whole place. I mean, they picked him up and just <laughs> walked him out, like straight out of that place. And then I just, I actually, I remember now I had to walk back around the bar. I even know how I got over the bar. It was really high. <laughs> it was like bar. launch. <laughs> yeah, I was obviously like, you know, the adrenaline was pumping or whatever. But as I walked around the bar now and I entered the bar the traditional way through the bar gate, and I was uh, greeted by a rapturous applause by uh, all the other <laughs> you know, thanks for getting this edit out of the way kind of thing. And uh, yes. I remember one guy giving me a 20 rand tip. He said, dude. Yeah, man, that was amazing. Here's a twenty rand tip for you. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, cool. That's so cool. So, wow. Yeah, yeah, I'm not so fun sometimes. Uh, for the most part, it's been super fun, but you know, as I say, some guys they take it to another level. Yeah, yeah. I guess when you, you know, what happens is when someone is on a certain mission and a, and you can see it on their face, like you had that mission, like you were saying with your with your pick and you were going generally speaking, people don't mess with that. You know, you're just like, okay, this guy's just going where he wants to go. He's, he's got focus and all that. And that's, that's just cool to hear. That's why you generally didn't get a lot of flack, I guess, you know, yeah, but moving exactly. forward, you, you know, you, you've been married now for 11 years, you have three youngsters and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how did you, um, you know, do your bartending and, and find the common ground between being a family man I'm um, raising a family and being the, the, the sort of professional bartender. Yeah, no, I mean, it hasn't been easy at all. Um, especially when they were really young. I mean, my oldest is 10 now. Um, so when we first had her, he was, she was young. Um, and when babies are really that small, it requires a lot of you, you know, um, by the time she was born, I had already left the bar and started our, our, our company, which we still currently run now, which is a mobile bartending catering business for cocktails. And uh, I just, I found it very tough because I was spending a lot of time um, out at functions, especially in those days, we didn't have people that work for us. I worked the bar myself. So I would, uh, we basically built these mobile units. I would take them to the function, set them all up, actually work the function, break it all down, you know, put it all in the van and then, and then come home and then sort of step and repeat that um, throughout the week. And um, I just thought it was tough because, you know, young children, you know, when you come home, the last thing you want to do is be awake for a long time. You want to just, you know, go to sleep, but you know, then the little one is up and they're up like every two hours throughout the night, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, it was a very, very, very challenging time uh, to be alive really. <laughs> and I just, I, I had a, a very cushy job just before that where I was a brand ambassador for uh, a company called Brandhouse, which is um, Diageo is one of the biggest um, liquor spirits companies in the world. And uh, I was a brand ambassador for them for four years. Uh, I was brand ambassador for a brand called Jose Cuevo Tequila. Mm -hmm, cool. And um, I just left that and it was a pretty, pretty cushy job. You know what I mean? We had lots of benefits and uh, life was good and easy and, because I wanted to pursue a career as a flair bartender, I had to leave that job. And then uh, the only thing that we had to do was just sort of promote me as a flair guy. And then that's where the, you know, hiring me out came and then hiring me and a bar and then me and a bar and a friend. And then it just got uh, grew from there. But um, in hindsight, if I think about it right now, I would not have left that job. Um, my wife who works with me still now, she wouldn't have left her job. I mean, she basically left it to support me in my, anyway, I just, I mean, I wouldn't have done that. You know, like you're going to leave a, a job where you have solid money, solid income, you know, exactly what you're getting to uh, both of us uh, not having jobs and having a child. Uh, and now we've got to go out and get our own business and our own work, you know, mm -hmm. like a jungle cat, you know, where I spent <laughs> previous, 
previous years as the sort of like domesticated house cat where people brought me milk on a saucer every morning. <laughs> now I have to go out and actually hunt, you know, and go and catch my own food, you know, type of thing. And uh, we, we, we joke about it all the time. I mean, our business is doing super well right now, but if I think about it, like the balls that we had to leave our, our jobs to start a business which could or could not work with a, a, a young baby like that, no, man, sure. What were we thinking? <laughs> you know, what were we thinking? We were 27 years old and you're not really thinking, you know. And then I, you know, subsequently after that, we had a, our son, um, Levi, two years after that, 2009. And then we were kind of done. So we had the girl, we had the boy, what they call a pigeon pair. And boom, you know, great. Life is good. And uh, we didn't plan on having a third child. But, you know, I suppose life is a way of, of getting in the way when you have other plans, you know, and uh, then we had Cameron, who's our youngest one, she's five now, in 2013. And, uh, and it's great. I mean, I, I absolutely love it. It's still challenging. I mean, I work last night, I've been working over the weekends. And uh, it's still even though we, we you know, we're a big company now, I still it's a lot is demanded of me, you know, I'm doing a lot of um, film shoots and stuff, which are like 12 hours long, into the night or early rises, you know, I miss school runs. Um, you know, I'll miss them at like last night, for instance, I'll miss bedtime, bath time, story time, all that sort of thing, you know, and it, uh, yeah, and it, 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 it bothers me, uh, obviously, um, but it bothers them um, more because I, I can see it on their faces whenever I go out of my room and I'm dressed sort of after three o'clock in the afternoon, they know straight away, you know, you're dressed, you know, what do you, what do you dress mm-hmm. for? Or like, where, where are you going? You know? And the last thing they want to hear is I'm going to work now. And then they just freak out, you know, it's like, how, oh, you know, especially my little one it doesn't understand it. So it's always like, ah, oh, but you're always working. You're always working. And, uh, I know last night when I had to jump out and go and do a quick presentation, you know, she just said to me, no, you can't go. It's like, so, wow. so, but, That's like, tough, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go, love you. I'm not going to go. I'm just going to go outside quickly and take the rubbish <laughs> out. And then I'm going to come back in now. She's like, oh, okay, cool. And then, just go and gone and it just doesn't know that I've gone until I come back and it's like you said you're going to send the trace and then you actually left I'm thinking you know yeah, so it's been, it's been tough yeah it's been tough it hasn't been easy at all but I wouldn't have changed it um, I, you know even if I could have changed it I wouldn't have done it. it's been perfect the way that we've done it for us I just hope for the for the kids that it's been cool too you know like you never really know how they've affected by it you know they don't really speak much to you about mm. it so yeah. Yeah. I don't think an entrepreneurship should be underestimated by anybody. It's, um, it's definitely a yeah. tough road and uh, it, it involves probably more hours than you'll ever do if you work in a corporate gig. And, um, but I guess there's, there's other benefits that do pay off too. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. So, so Trav, you've obviously, uh, throughout your career, you've like represented South Africa around the world and, uh, traveled the world. Of course, you've won many competitions, but, this year has been quite a special one. Uh, there was a competition, um, as far as I know, it's called World Class. I think it's run by Diageo. And you you won the event in South Africa. And then you went and you represented us uh, in Germany. And uh, you basically came fifth in the world. And that's rather incredible. Out of 60 countries, 10,000 people, it's uh, truly phenomenal. So firstly, congratulations on that. It's really cool. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think for, um, it's all about expectation really like, um, for something like world-class where you were talking about 10,000 bartenders globally, you enter it. Mm. It's like a big deal in terms of global competitions. It is the pinnacle. It is the competition that people always want to enter and want to win. And, um, if I had to give advice to anybody who's going to go down that road now and compete in this competition, um, if you are going to do any damage in it whatsoever, you're going to have to believe that you're going to win the global edition of it from when you start, mm. because it's a, it takes you about seven months, maybe the whole competition, you know, if, wow. if you've got to go through an online um, submissions and they cut you down from there, then there's uh, they come to your bar and you have to make drinks for them there. Then you get into a regional qualifier. You've got to make your way through that. Then you get a national qualifier, you make your way through that, and then you only go to the global. So it's a long process. And I think that if anybody is, is, is standing at, the, at step one, looking forward to world class, they're going to have to believe that they're going to win world class from the outset. Like um, that is the, uh, the mode that your mind must be in to produce those uh, level of performances. And that's where I was. And um, 
you know, coming fifth was an amazing feat for a South African because we don't normally place very high in these sort of competitions. Um, but because I expected to win it, when I came first, it was like a bit of a disappointment. And so it's all about managing your expectation. You know, if I'd come there thinking, oh, look, I'm going to come 59. Yeah. You know, or, yeah. And then you come first and you think, whoa, you know, like you really overachieved, you know. And I think that was uh, the only thing that I have uh, um, to think back about and say, you know, I would have done it differently. But if I didn't go there thinking I was going to win it, then I probably wouldn't have come fifth anyway, you know. So, um a bit of a tough one, yeah, coming fifth because it was the first available spot after the finalists. So when you when you start at every single challenge, they keep whittling you down. So mm -hmm. like if it's like the top sixty, then they get to the top twenty, and then from there, they normally go to the top six. And this was the first year that they did a top four because the format was uh, conducive to a top four instead of a top six. So, and I was bombed out of the competition uh, on mm -hmm. the final day. And, uh, and I didn't know that I'd come fifth. Obviously, in your mind, immediately you think you came 19th or 20th then, mm. you know. And it wasn't until they released the results. When I was already back home in South Africa, they released the official results. That's the first time I saw that I'd come fifth. And I was like, wow. At first, really angry. You know, I was like, oh, my gosh. So but close. I would, would have rather come 20th, you know, like anywhere else other than fifth, you know. But to know that you, you know, you jumped in that pool and, you know, you swam with the best swimmers in in the world, you know, and, you know, you did everything you possibly could except touch the other side first. Um, then in the preceding weeks after that, uh, or not preceding, but in the weeks following that, then I really became uh, very happy and uh, proud about that sort of uh, achievement. I think the guy, um, the highest position for a South African bartender in that competition previous to me was 12. Cool. So, yeah, yeah. So it ended up being quite a big thing. Uh, and I was, yeah, super happy, super relieved. Good competition to uh, to win. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. which was uh, a tough uh, one for me because yeah, go Craig. No, 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 no. Sorry, I thought you finished. Carry on. No, no. Sorry, it's just it was a tough one for me because you know, um, you know, I'm like 38 now, so I'm like sort of the post-peak bartender. You know, like I mean, I was peaking in my mid 20s type of thing, where you know all the competitions that uh, that I entered and that I, that I won. You know, the first time that I went to represent South Africa at a global competition was in 2003 in Las Vegas. Hmm. And, um, you know, that's, you know, 2003 is a long time ago now, you know, and a lot of people who are competing against me right now will not even know, you know, anything about that world or the level or what it takes. Hmm. You know, that sort of experience is just so different to what it is now, you know, and um, uh, this year, uh, um, as you say, has been a... a a, a landfill year for me because and, you know, I was sort of wandering a sort of competition wasteland for quite a number of years now because the last uh, national competition that I won before this one was in 2014. Hmm. So for about four years now, I've been sort of winless, but still sort of competing against all these young guys who are exceptionally talented and, you know, I never did any damage. You know, I competed at world class for, um, uh, three years before actually winning it, you know, first two years, I didn't come anywhere. I didn't even make, I, 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 uh, I made nothing. The uh, second year, I think I made a regional final. Then the third year I made a national final and then only the fourth year that I won it. So I was always getting better and better, but mm. like I was, a, I was already, um, you know, like maybe I'd won maybe 13 national championships before this one. Huh. So I, uh, yeah, I almost had that tag about being, like a pre like a winner from a previous year you know almost like a dinosaur <laughs> from the jurassic period that you know now we're in the triassic period so don't worry about that guy because he's from another time you know and i found it uh, very difficult to find my way in, in the competition realm you know especially since the art of flair had basically dissipated now which was what i was so good at mm. as a youngster and i'd won all of those titles being a flair bartender and now play in South Africa is almost dead. Even globally, it's battling. And the, uh, the emphasis is all about the drink now and the quality of the drink and the presentation. So mixology is now overtaking flair as a way of deciding who is good as a bartender and who is not. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult for me to be this like flair guy coming into the mixology world sort of post-peak 
and trying to do any damage. And as I say, for about four years, I was in this wasteland of not doing any damage whatsoever. You know, people pay me my respect and that's cool. And that's how bartenders are. They always will, you know, have you as their like legend or, or whatever, but they don't fear you um, in the competition realm, you know? And that's why it was a big thing for me to win world class this year, because it kind of made me uh, relevant um, or current again with the current bartenders now that weren't around 10 uh -huh. years ago, didn't, didn't see all those things that we did back then, you know? Mm. Um, so it was like a big thing for me. I, I, I know that I chased this dream of winning world class for a few years um, now. And now that it has actually happened, it's been the most rewarding, um, sort of most rewarding thing about my professional career as a bartender, no doubt. Yes. You certainly got an illustrious and yeah, just a really great career behind you and ahead of you, of course, as well, because, you know, less flair, you're getting older now, but you can still mix a good drink. So you'll, you'll thing, be all right. right. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Because like a lot of people, uh, for some reason, they're like, yeah, okay, no, um, especially when I was winning a lot of competitions, they were like, okay, well, we'll see someone else other than Travis, you know what I mean? And you know what, you're moving on a bit now, so you must move on. And I never really identified with that. I, under, I understand, like, maybe if you win a lot and you want to see new faces, that's cool. But don't bring in the age part to bartending. You know, I mean, we're not running, yeah, yeah. Not, running we're not running the Comrades Marathon here. If we were, then yes, maybe age is a factor and let the youngsters go on and off they go. You know, but bartending is the opposite, actually. I mean, uh, you're only getting better the older you get because you gain more experience and experience in bartending counts for a lot more than uh, a lot of other things, including even technique or skill, you know. So um, the older you better, as long as you're, improving on your technique and skill then you should be in a better position to win all these sort of things so i feel a little bit like roger federer you know that poor guy <laughs> I, follow him, I follow him a lot you know and everybody is always on and on about roger federer retiring it's like oh when are you going to retire roger when are you going to retire and he, he takes the same stance that i do you know he loves playing tennis you know and he just wants to play tennis whether that means because he's so good he plays at wimbledon or if he's just playing with his sons or whatever he just wants to play tennis. And that's the same that I feel, you know, like I'm not ready to just say, oh, okay, cool guys. I'm dropping Mike now. Off you go. <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah. I, I mean, I don't feel I'm old. You know, I don't feel like I can't compete. Uh, you know, I can't, I, I don't feel like I can't win competitions. So um, I don't have any uh, intentions of retiring. Uh, if and if that is a thing from bartending anytime <laughs> soon, you know, anytime soon. Yeah. I just, it's, it's something that I enjoy doing. I'm, I'm doing uh, what I love to do. I am doing well at it. Uh, and that's all that really should matter. You know, 100%. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, I, I think talking about beyond skill, you mentioned that a moment ago, and I guess um, there's a lot beyond just the, the mixing and the, what have you. Um, there's an amazing clip of you on YouTube about, um, how you sort of get to help the local communities in Cape Town and how you get them involved. And obviously this is quite an important part of, of what you do as well as just giving back as well. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about that, uh, please. Yeah. So, I mean, I, um, you know, admittedly before, uh, this year I had never really, um, thought that I was going to, um, join any sort of bartending accolade or thing that I've done or achieved with any um, f philanthropic idea you know I just I didn't really see the correlation between bar between bartending and helping other people you know so um, uh, it wasn't until uh, world-class winning world-class in terms of the global um, challenges that we had to do now this was just before we went to Berlin the first challenge we had to do um, which was form part of the global uh, challenges, but it was something you had to do in your own um, community. And basically it was uh, sponsored by Kettle One Vodka. And what they wanted to do is they wanted you to go out into your communities and they wanted you to help a faction uh, or a part of your community by designing, <clears throat> excuse me, by designing a cocktail um, that is made in a specific way or a new way or a new rendition. And however your new way or rendition is, that should help a portion of your of your community. So uh, basically, all the bartenders, the sixty guys from around the world, had to go out now and um, design a way that they were going to design a new cocktail 
and the way they design it was going to help a specific part of their community. So I was sitting here thinking, cool, well, look, I'm going to, what am I going to do? You know, I'm going to, let's start with water. I thought because Cape Town at that stage was going through a serious water crisis. Like mm. uh, we were going through a drought and then I thought, okay, well, look, um, bartenders are notorious for going through spans and spans of ice. It's such a waste of water. So why don't I juice um, tomatoes? I'll clarify the tomato juice to make it completely clear. I'll freeze those and then we'll use clarified tomato water as ice for chilling drinks. And um, that's where I first started and that's what brought me to the Bloody Mary. And uh, then I thought, no, um, you know, it's maybe a bit obvious. You know, obviously you're still competing. You want to make something that's really, really wild. Then the next thing that's uh, what people were talking about is um, straws. Uh, because I don't know if you know this, but there's a big no straw movement going down mm-hmm. around the world right now. Single use plastic is like the enemy. And um, I thought I was going to design some mold uh, that I'd make a, like a, a piece of a glass that would fit over a normal glass or actually blow, hand blow a glass that had a straw already in it. And then therefore we wouldn't need straws. Like if you needed to drink, you would just drink straight from the straw that's blown into the glass. <clears throat> then I thought, nope. We're not going to do that either because that's also a bit obvious. I'm pretty sure everybody's going to do something about the no straw movement. And then, um, it's, you know, thinking about it a little bit more, we came across this idea of impactful purchasing. And I'll, um, then we were thinking about how we actually spend so much money about buying certain ingredients to make certain drinks that we have in a bar. And, you know, people like Woolworths, Pick and Pay, all of these major stores are benefiting from us buying stuff from them. For instance, the Bloody Mary that I wanted to make, if I wanted to um, uh, juice tomatoes, I'd go to Woolworths and buy from them and Woolworths would be happy. You know, they're making their money, off you go. So um, we thought, no, cool, let's not uh, uh, give the benefit to the chains. They're doing super well as they're doing. You know, we can go to like the guy on the corner that's selling uh, tomatoes and let's get the tomatoes from him, you know, because he needs the help and support more than anybody else. And when it comes to bartending, a lot of the drinks that we make, we have to prepare like a sugar syrup, you have to boil water and sugar. But now we're going super technical and we're doing other ingredients that require more than just boiling water and putting sugar in it. And I designed a drink where we had to make a Mary mix for a Bloody Mary. And we went and bought the tomatoes from a... Um, like a, a market in, in Epping, which is here in Cape Town. And then I took them to the, the Haven shelter. Now the Haven is a shelter in Cape Town. They've got a few shelters here and their whole mantra is about um, recycling people off the street and getting them back into their community, into their homes. So it's a shelter, but you can't like go there and just live there for the rest of your life. You know, they have to sort of uplift you or upskill you in a way that they would get you, like re-renovated and could get you back home to wherever you live, you know, because there's obviously a lot of homeless people in South Africa. One in three people in South Africa are um, unemployed and unemployment leads to, leads to poverty and poverty leads to people on the home. So it's a bit of a scary thing. And that's why we were like, okay, cool. Let's connect all of these dots now with poverty. We've got homeless people. We've got bartenders that need people to make stuff for them because bartenders don't want to sit there making prep, of this amount of sugar syrup and this Bloody Mary mix and all this sort of stuff. So I thought, well, let's train and upskill the people who come through the Haven shelter. We'll teach them how to make this mix and they'll make the mix for us. And then we'll buy the mix from them rather than buying uh, a mix from a, a, a global store like Woolies or something like that. And that's exactly what we did. That was the whole idea. It was basically why we called it impactful purchasing, like being, considerate of, of, of our purchases in the bar and who's going to benefit from that, who's going to benefit from our purchases. And, uh, and that's where the idea was born. So we basically um, got all that stuff. We sent it to the Haven. I was there. I showed them what to do and they made me 150 Bloody Mary mixes, which came in a tomato sauce bottle. Wow. And then I took those and I just went to 50 different bars around the country. And I had the support of, of Kettle One, obviously, so I could fly to these different bars and whatever. I dropped it off with them and we gave them like a period of a month to just sell those out. And as those bars sold those drinks, then they would uh, give a percentage of the sales back to the Haven as well. So they were winning double there, you know, like we were buying the mix actually from them and we were getting um, the sales generated, a percentage of that going back to them as well. And uh, because of that challenge, I ended up being one of the top five 
in the world just to present for that challenge oh. um, out, of, out of the top 60 people. And I watched the other people and what their ideas were. I mean, amazing. I mean, what bartenders are doing right now, there was a, a, a guy in Kenya who was doing stuff with coffee and recycling coffee and um, getting all the coffee growers and the farmers involved. Um, there, there was guys in South America also doing very similar things with coffee. There was a guy in Ireland who was worried about the bee population. And yeah. basically he was taking like waste um, that we have in the bar and turning it into little coasters. And mm -hmm. if you, if you planted the, if you bought his drink and we served on this coaster and if you planted this coaster, it would create a little flower, which would no then ways. help the bee to pollinate and then increase the, 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 the bee um, population. Wow. So <laughs> bartenders cool. are actually, and that's what I'm saying up until that challenge, I was never, it was not on my radar, you know, but now all of a sudden bartenders are thinking of ways in which the, the, the processes of making drinks in their bars, how they can um, redirect that to impact their community and positively uplift a portion of their community, whether it was for me through the homeless or for him helping the bees, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. So bartenders are actually carrying this, this mantra of being philanthropists in their community because the bar, let's be honest, I mean, it doesn't have a good rep to it. You know, people mm -hmm. don't look at, at, you know, I mean, booze does not have a good connotation to it. And I just thought it was such a nice thing because now we're actually making a good connotation and we're saying, okay, well, look, as bartenders, we can make a difference and we can help other people, you know, and uh, bartenders as, as, as a whole are um, people that help people anyway. I mean, help them every day, just be happy by it serving them drinks every day, you know, it's just the way bartenders are. Super hmm. cool, man. Yeah, I really love that. Um, and then how have you found, is it, has it like kicked off at all? Like if, has it gone a little bit further than, you know, that initial? Um, yeah, so we did one more did. run off the initial challenge one. Um, and then from there now, we're actually in a process of uh, redirecting it a little bit, um, purely because we're having a little bit of, uh, not, challenges but the, the drink that I designed was a Bloody Mary and I don't know if in, in Australia or in, in England if it's a, a popular drink but the Bloody Mary in South Africa is a bit of a hard sell so <laughs> you know I mean when I was making these things for them taking it to them and asking them to sell like 15 um, units in a month meanwhile they probably sell 15 Bloody Marys in a year in, in their bar you know so it's not a very popular drink so what I want to do is I actually want to change it up now, not do the Haven Mary, um, which is a Bloody Mary, but actually change it to the Haven drinks movement so that it won't just um, refer to one cocktail. It'll refer to every single cocktail that is made or mix that is made at the Haven shelter. They will get mm. the same benefit that they will that they did from the Haven Mary itself. So I want to expand it now into, um, into other drinks, uh, drinks that will be more popular, more accessible, more, more people will enjoy them. Something like a mule, for instance, which is uh, vodka, sugar, lemon, and ginger beer. It's a, mm. like a summer refreshing thing. So uh, I'm chatting to uh, the guys that did a, a canning um, exercise for me for another challenge in that competition. I'm, I'm chatting to them about canning uh, my own um, mule. Uh, maybe a thousand. I'm asking him to do a thousand cans. This poor dude in his manual canner is going to be working overtime. <laughs> but um, if he can make a thousand uh, mules for me, then uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, uh, get those drinks into all of the bars for all the people that I met now at the Globals and have them mm. buy this drink from me here mm. and um, get the Haven to make the mix give it to me, I'll take it to the guy who cans it, he'll can it, and then we'll sell this, mm -hmm. um, this canned version of the Haven Mary, which was in a bottle, and cans can go um, in planes and across the world and stuff, and uh, do exactly what we did, but not on a local or national scale, but on an international global that's scale. Big, so that's, that's where we are right now. And um, uh, yeah, so all I, I basically need to do is to get the go ahead from our canning guy who says he can actually do that that quality or that quantity and uh, and then off we go with that so once again i'm going to ask um for a little bit of assistance uh from kettle one which is the vodka that we did that in, uh, initial thing with the haven mary and uh yeah so they'll assist me in, in in hopefully getting all of the ingredients um paying for the canning process all that sort of stuff um to the haven and then once it's at the haven then the rest hopefully will be history mm, awesome 
It's really exciting and well done. It's really such a like heartwarming story. Have there been any uh, like great moments with the guys you're helping? Have they gone like, you know, thanks Trav, you know, you've, you've given me a bit of hope or anything like that? No, not really. The, um, during my presentation, when I was actually in Berlin to present the whole concept, I had um, two pictures of the uh, of of guys that had been rehabilitated through the heaven, and I actually printed their pictures out, and I um, I custom made coasters with their faces on, and I served the drinks on their uh, on their faces on their coasters as uh, two um, real life incidences of people who had been rehabilitated um, through it. But um, obviously, the guy who's Hussein, he's the guy who runs the actual haven that uh, we're running this program through. He's obviously massively, um, massively thankful. But um, most of the people that actually work, or, or I, don't know, I can't really say that they work, but that are at the haven, um, who actually do most of the mixes. Because when you go there, I mean, you don't, you're not working there. They, they don't, they, they don't pay you. We, we, we pay them. But um, basically, if you go to the haven, you have to like do something like clean a toilet or you have to make dinner or, or, or something like that. Those, those people that we were with making the Haven mix for, they, they don't even know the, um, uh, the severity of what they are doing themselves. As far mm -hmm. as they are concerned, they're making uh, a mix because they were basically told um, to make a mix, you know? So um, we have received uh, from the top guys down I and mean, they understand it and they, they're great. If you ever watch that video, you'll see Hussein in that video. He's the guy who we deal with um, on the, the, the ground level um, uh, side. You know, I, I don't know what their reaction has been. Okay, cool. Cool, man. And, and so, but just uh, like, I mean, we, I guess we, we are coming close to the end of the chat, but if, is it possible to just briefly give a bit of, a bit of an overview about like say professional bartendering mixology um, you know, like just, just a, a little bit about sort of how, how the industry actually works. I mean, if you can summarize it. Um, yeah. You know, so, I mean, bartending is a pretty tight um, unit. Uh, if you wanted to get into bartending, you pretty much have to get in via and in. It's almost like the matrix. <laughs> like um, you need to know like Morpheus before you can become Neo kind of thing, you know? And then when you're in the matrix, if you want to come out to the real world, you almost have to get a dial up and find like a, a phone booth and off you go and you can get back to the real world as well. <laughs> I mean, if anybody wants to become a bartender, they must understand that it's the opposite of life. You know, it's almost like you're living on earth too. When everybody's sleeping, you're working. When everybody's working, you're sleeping, you know? So you keep really odd hours. And um, it, 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 as it goes as well, you're serving everybody um, while everybody is enjoying themselves, you know, so you'll go and do a party or people come to your bar. Everybody is like partying, but you are now working, you know, so it's always the, the opposite. Uh, it's a very confusing world at first. Um, I used to call us day walkers, which is like, <laughs> a, a really blade. it's yeah. like a guy who's like half vampire and half normal. And, you know, he, he can walk during the day because he's got human blood in him, which is what we are now. You know, if you ever see a bartender <laughs> walking around during the day, we call him day walker, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so if you wanted to do it, uh, you'd have to study, I'm afraid. It's not something where you, back in the olden days, you could get into bartending, you fall into it, and then you just learn your way on, on, on the job training. Mm. Um, but these days, no, it's more of a study thing. You kind of have to go and learn. You'll do like some C category bartending course. So you do an, a course online or something like that. You have to learn all of the basics. And once you get your, um, your certification, then you can take that to a bar. And what they'll do then is they'll take you in and then they'll take over and do your on the job training from there where you'll learn all the practical stuff and how to make drinks. Cause up until that time, it will be more theoretical than practical. Mm. And then um, once you've learned that sort of stuff, then you'll go and uh, apply for a job probably somewhere else uh, or even at the place where you were learning and, 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 and off you go. Um, the easier way to do it is if you know someone who is a bartender, um, then they normally have good ideas as to where to study or where the jobs are, are going, like who's looking for jobs, where you can get in, where you can get out. And uh, you know, most of the people that I know that work as bartenders now or get in through an in through one of their friends or, or, or something like that. You know, most of the people who sort of study when they're at university and whatever, they don't stay in the industry. They, they're doing exactly that. They're actually studying at university. They want to do like a little 
sideline gig where they get some bucks so that they can do some stuff on the weekend. Um, and they're not serious bartenders like like the bartenders I'm talking about now, mm. you know. Um, normally, it's, it's a case where you see someone flare or see someone mix and you're like, you're totally smitten by it. Exactly like I was when I saw my brother flicking those bottles. And mm-hmm. uh, then you ask that person or their friend of yours and then they kind of like bring you into this like weird industry, you know, and then they are your your touch point to get in, you know, and then that person basically vouches for you and then and then off you go. But once you're in, you're in. I mean, it's a very, very tight group even when i was talking about the haven mary now and i wanted to go and sell all of those haven mary mixes in in those bars i mean if you walked up the street right now and said hey i want you to sell this bloody mary mix they'd look at you funny but because they're all friends mm. of mine and the mm. bartender the community they embrace you and like yeah oh, no for sure we'll definitely do it and each one of them would actually go and put um a video clip of them making the drink as well cool. you know they'll That's support cool. you you know they um bartenders are like that they're very supportive of each other you know very proud of each other um, I'm talking about real pro bartenders now, not the guys who do the weekend gigging stuff, you know? Yeah. It, it sounds like a real nice intersection of what you do between sort of science and art. It's a, um, you know, there's a, it's a real good mix of, excuse the pun, of, of both of those, I reckon. Yeah. No, and, and, and the good thing you say that, because like a lot of people don't really recognize how difficult it is to do some of the things that we do. And you're just gain an understanding of, of drinks and what goes together and how to um, manipulate uh, ingredients to have a certain flavor. You know, it's very, very, um, very similar to chefing. Obviously people who are chefs, they get the respect, you know, people understand that they know that and they're like, yeah, chef, chef, chefs. Bartending is only now starting to gain notoriety as professional people who are skilled, trained, you know, they belong in a profession that they want to belong in. They're therefore, by choice, you know, not because they were good at nothing else, you know. Um, and I think it's starting to head that way now more and more so. Um, just wanting to get the respect that, that, that most sort of chefs and cooks do. Yeah, because there's been a real, like, shift in that industry, hasn't there? Like, you know, like, it, so. yeah, it's, it's been, it's quite amazing what chefs are doing these days. And um, actually, from speaking to Doug, he said it's kind of filtering down, like you said now, into, um, into bartendering. And it's yeah. a bit more scientific, like, you know, the molecular uh, sort of technology and that sort of stuff. So it sounds, it sounds like it's, uh, like Craig said, a serious art and science mix, which is, which is really exciting for you, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. I see that, um, you know, we uh, as bartenders have always looked to the kitchen as like a direction of where we're going to go. You know, they always seem to lead the way for us. And then whatever techniques and procedures they um, employ in the kitchen, we always end up doing something very similar like that, you know, in the bar. Like I know that hydrocolloids were very big about 10 years ago. Now a hydrocolloid is like, if you take any sort of puree or flavored liqueur or something like that, you can, uh, if you make a salt bath and you pump some sodium alginate into it, when you drip them very slowly into that salt bath, it forms like a little caviar ball filled with whatever flavor you've got, you know? Mm. And I remember, I remember almost the day that it came from the kitchen into the bar you know um a guy made a deconstructed mojito and he did like a a, a lime coulis and a, and a mint syrup and uh he made hydrocolloids out of that and <laughs> he basically made this um sort of rum sugar mix almost and uh he had these um balls which he put into a soda siphon and he siphoned it in into this rum mix and because of the soda and the um and the carbon dioxide it made these balls float inside this drink i remember looking at it <laughs> wow that's like cosmic you know yeah. and then but you can't just go ahead and go oh well, i'm going to do that now you know what i mean you have to <laughs> figure out you know what what kind of science is behind it to make that casing to make the hydrochloride you know and then and and that's why it's more of an understanding now to be a bartender and it's not just okay cool well what goes well with tonic oh gin you know, okay, make a gin yeah. and tonic. That's completely a, a, a new animal, completely. Hmm. So and cool. May, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about your business that you'd set up, the perfect serve. You, you spoke briefly about it earlier, but uh, before we sort of finish off, it would be great just to hear about what you're doing there with, along with your wife. Yeah, so we do the perfect serve. It's a mobile bartending company. And um, yeah, things are going super well right now. I'd say that maybe... Uh, 90% of all of our business gets run through brands. 
Um, and then maybe the other 10% will do like uh, specialized house parties, like uh, uh, 21st or 50th, we do quite a few weddings, um, that sort of stuff. So, I mean, uh, the easiest way to translate it to people that will understand is that it's, it's a catering company, that's what we do, but we don't do food, we do drinks. So people will come to us, say, I'm gonna get married, and I'd like you to run a bar service for us, and then you basically deconstruct it from the beginning to the end. So. Um, people might think, yeah, it's just me and I, I dress up in my suit and I go and work a bar. But nowadays, I mean, we have storage, we've got logistics, we've got mobile units that, you know, fold out in different ways, different lighting schemes, we brand them. Um, you know, our, our warehousing is filled now with ice cream machines, you know, like fridges, slash puppy machines. We've got every type of glass you can think of. You know, you want a Nick and Laura glass here, yeah, a Mary Antoinette Coupia, you want a tall glass mm -hmm. and different styles. And so like the warehousing that you need for something like this is actually quite, quite big. You know, even though I'd say our team is very small, there's only five of us that are permanently employed in the company, but you no, know, we will do like maybe 12 events this week, you know, and the five of us will have to manage all of those events. And it's everything from the bar to the ice, different types of ice. Cause you know, ice, you know, people are always like, oh, just get some crushed ice or cubed ice. But now we get ice that are specific sizes and we get people huh. to cut it to us. You know, it needs to be either five centimeters by five centimeters or three by three hmm. or three by five, depending on the glass. And so it's become a super technical um, thing to be involved in. And I remember when I first started, uh, we had like vessel tables. We used to fold out and cover them with like um, black tablecloth, you know? <laughs> And you used to put all the bottles on top and the ice buckets were on top as well. So you know, you wanted to scoop ice and you'd knock over the bottle of vodka and it was very clumsy. You know? <laughs> and now we have like dedicated units that we actually send there. And it's like being behind a bar that's been there forever, you know, type of thing. Mm. You have know, dedicated speed rails, ice wells. And um, yeah, we basically need to create a bar that doesn't look like it's just got there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but, it, but it has, you know, it needs to operate like it's been there forever, but it needs to break down. Like it's been there for like a night, you know? Mm. So it's very cool. And I really enjoyed it. As I say, it was the most natural thing for us to do as well, because, um, you know, when you're going to stop being a bartender, you know, once your knees sort of give up and, you know, you're not going to stand nine hours behind a bar anymore, you need to figure out other ways to commercially support you and your family and um, you know this was sort of the easiest way especially when we broke away I was uh, working for Diageo at the time and uh, what happened was is I entered a, a competition which was sponsored by another brand the Sky Vodka which is not distributed by Diageo and because I work for Diageo um, they found it uh, um, how do I say like a conflict of interest because I won that competition and I ended up being in the newspaper the following day wearing a Sky Vodka t-shirt <laughs> and you know, like throwing around sky vodka bottles and whatever. So when they, they called me in the following day, they said, well, look, you know, you work for Diageo, you must represent only Diageo products, obviously, you know? And they said, well, you know, it's very simple for you, Trav. You've got to either A, stop flaring and uh, commit yourself to being a, a full-time brand ambassador, or B, you can resign and you can pursue your career as this flair bartender guy, you know, so have a think about it. So I did think about it uh, overnight. And then the next day I went in, I handed in my resignation. Um, and then from there on out, I just said, look, yeah, I want to be a flair bartender. And um, that's the road I choose and chose. And, and that was it. I mean, from then, which was 2007, I ended up winning like eight national titles in a row, you know, so it was really, <laughs> it was a good thing for me because then I didn't have to worry about work and I could actually dedicate serious time to practice, you know? Mm. And uh, because I'd won so many of these titles, um, it was easier for us also to get, to get work because I was notorious. People knew who I was and, you know, I was in newspapers and stuff. So that really was easy for us to go from, from that world into the mobile bar tending world. And obviously the edge obviously supported me as well with anything they required that needed a mobile bar tending catering business as well. So, I mean, it was super easy um, to transition, but not easy to, um, to do. Mm -hmm. 
because of the whole kids having kids thing or whatever. What were we thinking? I don't know. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool, man. But wow, but what a great story. Thank you so much for sharing everything with us. And yeah, man. Um, awesome. You know, I feel like we could talk for, for hours, that's for sure. And we could definitely. So uh, at no, some point, we'll probably have to have a round two so we can get more into the detail, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of yeah. stuff that, that, uh, that is so interesting to know about the industry. Uh, but just the last question which we've kind of started asking our guests uh, recently is what is it, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Sure. Ridiculously human. I mean, I love that, uh, that name, by the way, it's so awesome because, <laughs> you know, I've always found that people are becoming unhuman actually, like uh, as we progress as a race or whatever you want to call us, like we are sort of becoming, um, desensitized to each other and you know we don't really treat each other with much respect and um, you know if you're driving in your car you'll see this all the time people drive however they want to because they just don't really have any consideration for each other because they know they don't really mind who you are they're not really considering who you are you know so mm. we are becoming unhumane actually you know ridiculously unhumane and uh, never mind, you know, being a philanthropist or doing anything super special or anything like that. We just, we're battling to just, you know, basically be human with each other, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that's sort of going to happen in our lifetime. When it comes to my children, it's always about uh, being selfless and respectful and considerate of other people and stuff like that. And for me, that is just to be human really but to be ridiculously human is then to take that and do something which no one else is doing um not just the basic stuff which is human but go and help someone else you know and uh, whatever uh, sphere of life you are in uh, whatever business you are involved in whatever profession even if you're a lowly bartender there is some way in your life that you can dedicate to helping other people and also helping yourself obviously and if you are actively going out, not to just be a normal human, but to be a superhuman and not just performing the basic requirements of a human towards another human, and you're actually going out of your way to help someone else. And that for me would be someone who is ridiculously human. Just so, drop the mic. Woo, yeah, drop that mic, mic, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. so I love the name, man. Ridiculously <laughs> human. Open, Thank uh, you. Out the top <laughs> You know, and I, I, I'm always looking for like names of different things that I want to do, like when I open up my bars and stuff, you know, so naming is always a big thing. Or when you name a cocktail, if you design a cocktail, yeah. you've got to give it a name. You know, nobody wants to drink the almost average drink, the almost yeah. average drink, you know, so you've got to make it sound like appealing and you guys have done <laughs> that. that. So well done, man. Well Thank done. Thank you. No, that was epic. That was a really great way to put it. And it's, it, it blows us away often like you know just hearing someone else's take on something we've thought about so much is um is very valuable and special so so thanks for that and and also just thanks for your time today so um you know if people are uh well there's two things really like what are you up to going forward now and also how can people get in contact with you and actually uh you know get in, uh, use your services and that kind of thing yeah so um Next step for us is we want to um, pursue um, the global rendition of the Haven Mary and the Haven Drinks movement. So um, I don't have a hashtag for that, I don't think, anyway. I do, but um, I, I don't want to say it because it's, it's the Haven Mary and now I want to change it to the Haven Drinks movement. So I won't put that out um, just yet, but I really want to aggressively pursue that. Um, we're also going to open up a, a bar here in Cape Town as well. I'm cool. um, called the Vicious Virgin. Cool. Um, so Oaks must come and say how's it um, yeah. there. They'll get the best. It's going to be a rum tiki bar. And cool. um, yeah, if they need any bartending services or anything like that, www.theperfectserve.co.za. Otherwise, the most current thing is to go on our Facebook page. But if you want to follow me, I'm the guy. Splash Purist is my Instagram handle. Cool. And um, obviously, being a purist in anything is a good thing. But when it comes to bartending, being a purist is... Uh, is, is, is something special. You know, everybody should be puristic at whatever they do, but bartending especially. And uh, yeah, man, I'm sure you can find me uh, in, in most of those ways. You know, being 38, I'm not like so technically savvy, 
and uh, I don't have like all these uh, awesome things. And I only found out recently that Instagram is bigger than Facebook. Can you believe that? <laughs> um, and ever since then, I've been hitting this Instagram thing quite hard. So yeah, you can find me, uh, find me on Facebook or Instagram. I don't, I don't mind either one. I do normally reply within one week. <laughs> I'm joking. But no, cool, guys. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks for the chat. I really enjoyed chatting with you guys. And thanks for the opportunity to tell the story. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you guys want to chat some more, just hit me up, man. Cool. Cool. For sure. I just wanted to just say thanks on my behalf. Like, you know, it's so weird, right? I, I almost feel like somehow I met, I've met you when we were youngsters because I remember there being this really good soccer player in primary school. I went to Bryanston Primary. Oh, and, yeah. And I, for some reason, I was like, uh, your name is just like really familiar for some reason. I'm like, I remember Travis couldn't been really good at soccer. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I actually made a, um, like our provincial side when I was nine. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it was like, uh, you know, a handful of boys who played provincial football when I was younger. So, yeah. um, I don't know. So maybe, I don't know if but, people speak about other people from other schools and clubs and whatever, but possibly. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't know, like it's, it's cool. It's been like this, this cool connection, like the, the whole time that we've chatted with you, but also just about your story. First of all, you, you're a very good speaker. Um, and it's very nice and easy to listen to you talk. Um, you speak very well and, and you, uh, Rose, well, you have a, you have a very nice smile and charisma about you. Um, Sweet, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I will, and, I'll tell my mom, she'll be super impressed. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. But, but just, um, you know, like, thanks for sharing something that's so different, uh, than what, you know, I guess most people actually do to, from in a day to day life. And it's, I think it's really important for people to hear stories like this, because like you said earlier on in the chat, people, look at barman like you're just a barman and and it's so pathetic that people you know do that they don't understand that first of all this is a human a human like you is actually doing your favor by making you a drink who's helping you with your evening or your afternoon or whatever the story is so exactly. the fact that you you some people they say look down on it is is really not that nice or whatever but um but actually for you to explain it further in terms of you know what like it's an art and it's a science and and all these other cool things and like you know it's a, it's a real profession and guys like to leave a legacy and it's really it's really really awesome um yeah. so thanks for that thanks for being a cool oak smiling and um yeah, just sharing a, a cool lacquer kiff Story. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, we didn't say Kiff earlier. Man, how did you miss that one? Man? No, no, I should have been on top of that. Yes. <laughs> hey, Craig, come on, man. Just, yeah. um, um, PE, that was the word, you know, that was the, that was the word I probably used way too much. But just briefly from my side, listen, like it's been, as Gareth said, just so interesting actually. And, and you really do speak well. So I'm, I'm, I can imagine your presentations must be a real pleasure to listen to and, uh, I must say I'm a little bit thirsty right now after this chat for some reason now. Gonna... <laughs> so uh, what was if it I could come and get a proper, a proper drink from you, that, but when we were in Cape Town next time, uh, then we're definitely going to pop our heads in there. And um, just thanks again for a really great informative chat. Absolutely, guys. I look forward to it. I really appreciate the time. Cool, man. Cool, man. Okay, dude. Take it Bye, easy. Man. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cape fold, mountain range. Gotta be 